You know, a long time ago, I learned that the most dangerous thing you can ever do is give a microphone to people when you don't know what it is they're going to say. But I love the way our kids help us. Do they not? Our kids help us every week. It, I, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm not just blessed and entertained. I'm actually helped in hearing from our children as they help lean into what it is that we're talking about and what it is that we've been studying together as a church over all these, these various weeks. In my personal opinion, and this is just a little soapbox moment, then I'll go ahead and get to the sermon. This is part of what makes First Baptist Church such a great place, is multi-generational worship. When we can see families lead us in worship through the reading of the Advent, when we can hear from some of the youngest amongst us as to what the Holy Spirit of the living God is actually saying to them. Because guess what? They're little human beings, right? And, and, and Christ is pursuing them just like he's pursuing me and pursuing you. So thank you, kids, for helping us uh, throughout this series. Heaven, reclaiming heaven. What kind of heaven were you expecting? So weeks ago, when we first opened this up, I think five Sundays ago, and when you heard me say that, hey, we're going to be studying what the Scriptures has to say about heaven, I just wondered, uh, how would you have answered that question? Five weeks ago, six weeks ago, if I would have said, what are you expecting to learn about heaven as we open up the Bible? I think some might have said, just in all honesty, said, well, I'm, I'm expecting it's going to be a boring place, right? It's just kind of a dull thing that, that's quite boring. I suspect others of you would have said, well, we're going to exist in some sort of angelic way, some sort of disembodied spirit, don't really understand it, but we're going to be floating around somewhere up there in this place called heaven. Now, I know there's others in this room, if you're being really, really honest, you would have said, I don't know. I don't even know what to expect because I haven't really thought long and hard about the doctrine of heaven. Well, over these last four weeks before today, what we've done is we've reclaimed the hope of heaven. We've looked at what the Scripture has to say about, as Sharon just said, a very real place called heaven. It's not a figment of our imagination, but it's a created place by our Heavenly Father, and it's a place of restoration, and it's a place of reconciliation. You may remember weeks ago we talked about heaven being a place of reunion, where yes, that, that Christ follower of yours that was, was your spouse or was your parent or was a child or was a family friend or a close neighbor who has gone on to be with the Lord before you and I, we will be reunited one day with them. And what a glorious reunion that's going to be. But we also talked in week one about not just a glorious reunion with your family members who loved Christ and have gone on before you, but most importantly, we're going to be united with Christ himself, the person who you were made to spend all of eternity with is named Jesus, and you will see him there. In the second week, we've talked about how, and we saw where our eternity, uh, our eternity depends upon what is our response to Jesus. And you may remember, it, it kind of stuck with a lot of us in, in that second week, we talked a lot about hell, because Jesus spoke a lot about hell as recorded in the four Gospels. And we looked at the reality of hell and how the gate is narrow that leads to heaven, but how grace is wide. And how our Lord wishes that all would come to a saving knowledge of Him. And how heaven is a glorious reality for all of those who believe that Christ is the very Son of God. A third thing that we've done in this series is we've, we've studied and we've pondered this present heaven. Do you remember that conversation that we had? Do you remember what the Scriptures had to say about this present heaven, this intermediate heaven that the Scripture speaks of? And, and that is the answer to this question. What happened to my Christian father about two and a half months ago when he passed away? Where did he go? Where did your spouse or your loved one, where did they go? And the Bible taught us about this temporary, this intermediate heaven. I'm calling this present heaven, a temporary place where Christians enter into the very presence of God immediately upon their physical body passing away. And then just most recently, we've reclaimed not just
body that the scripture promises in our future. Glorious in one way in that it is imperishable. Our body will never die again after he resurrects us. So today, as you've already heard, we're going to talk about eternal heaven. And this is the last Sunday in this series on reclaiming heaven. And eternal heaven is the answer to this question. What is the Christian's final destination? We know that our final destination is eternal life in a resurrected body with a resurrected Jesus on an entirely redeemed and renewed and resurrected earth. See, heaven and earth, the scripture teaches us, will one day be joined together. And you and I as Christ followers, we will finally be home. Church, listen to me. If you catch nothing else from this morning's time together, it's this. Our final destination is an earthly destination. Did you hear that? Heaven will come join with a renewed earth, an earth that Christ has made new. And isn't that really the place that we've all longed for? Hadn't you really, if you think about it, we've all been longing for that place uh, that, that was actually Adam and Eve got to experience it. They once enjoyed that perfect and that beautiful earth at that time. It's a beautiful place in part because it'll be made us as human beings to exist in a physical, tangible place called earth. Did you hear that? God made us as physical beings to occupy and to inhabit and, and, and to, to Jesus said he's going to go and prepare a place for us and he would take us to be with him there forever. That place is the new heaven on a new earth. And the scriptures tell us a lot about it. So let's look and see what do some of the scriptures have to say about a new heaven and a new earth. And by the way, we will end up in Revelation chapter 21. But before we get there, we jump all the way back even into one of the major prophetic books, the book of Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. Isaiah writes, as inspired by the Lord, I will create a new earth. The former things will not be remembered. Isaiah says again in chapter 66, verse 22, he speaks of the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, promises the Lord. Uh, through his man Peter, in 2 Peter 3, verse 13, God inspired Peter to write these words. He says, we wait for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. All throughout the the scriptures we see repeated instances where God has inspired his human authors to deliver the promise of God that one day there will be a new heaven one day there will be a new earth the most famous one the one that we all think about when we think about a new heavens and a new earth is found in John's writing called the book of Revelation you remember this apostle John uh, he's been given by the Lord himself he's given the vision of what the future is going to look like. He's given a vision of the end of all of history. And remember, before we get to chapter 21, to whom is John writing? He, he's writing to a church that is being and will, will be persecuted in ways that you and I cannot even begin to fathom. He's writing to some early Christ followers in this early church that's there where there is a desperate need for hope. There's a desperate need for something real and tangible because what Rome is doing to them and will be doing to them goes beyond what I want to describe in this church house here today, right? They need hope. They need to know what is the climax of all of human history. And what John comes in and tells them, the climax of end of all of human history is not that your individual souls and bodies will somehow escape this earth and will escape and go away to some other kind of place, but rather heaven will come down and Christ himself will transform the earth into a glorious place that his followers will occupy. So if you haven't turned there already, Re Revelation 21, just in those first five or six verses is where I'll largely be for the remainder of our time. 
John is writing in verse 1, and he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, I'm sorry, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Verse 5, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And I'll read verse 6, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Do you see what Revelation 21 begins to remind us about? It begins to remind me, and it might begin to remind you, that earth is not, or this world is not our home. This present world is not. This country that we live in, which I love as much as any man or woman you'll ever meet, this country is not our final destination. We are actually living for another place. We are living for another country. You remember, I've mentioned this a time or two in the past couple of weeks, when God inspired Paul in his letter that he wrote to the church at Philippi in chapter 3, verse 20, God says, our citizenship is in heaven, for we are waiting for a Savior from there. So Revelation chapter 21, it captures our minds and it, and it captures our hearts with a vision of this great city and of this great country that is to come one day. And, and that vision should change everything about how we live right here today. C.S. Lewis once wrote in, in Thinking of Heaven, he says, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for this present world were those who thought the most of the next world. The apostles themselves who set afoot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this world. So let's focus for just a moment then on the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem as spoken about in our scriptures. This is exactly the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem is exactly what Jesus is talking about when he says, I'm going to come and restore all things. In, in verse 5, we just read this where he says what? Behold, I am making all things new. And see, just in case you've ever heard this before, I, I don't believe it's, it's a teaching that is supported by the Scripture. This world will not cease to exist and disappear, but rather God says, I'm going to come and make it new. I'm going to resurrect, I'm going to restore this planet you and I call Earth into what I've always intended for it uh, to be. So what is it going to look like? What is the new Earth going to look like? The good news is, is that the Scripture gives us all kinds of hints and all kinds of details about the renewed earth. And all throughout these descriptions, we are told that it will be a place of great beauty and great joy. Think about this church. As beautiful and as inspiring as this present earth is, it is just a dim shadow of what is to come. So when one of our young ones talks about how beautiful Lake Tahoe is, when you get to go and visit it and see the snow and the lake and the water, when another one of our young ones says, do you know how beautiful it is to sit at the base of an ancient cypress tree with fresh water running by there? This is just a taste, a foreshadowing of the beauty and the majesty that our God has in store for us with a renewed or restored earth. That ought to make you just a little bit excited. It makes me. In chapter 21, verse 2, John tells us, God tells us about this place. He says it will be a holy city. Did you notice that word? A city is present there. And also in verse 2, a place pre prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Do you get the picture that's being communicated there? What does a bride look like 
who has been adorned. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying it for her husband. Well, one of the many pleasures, one of the many joys that I get to experience as a pastor is every now and then when, when young people ask me, and me, sometimes even not so young people, have asked me to officiate their wedding ceremony. And I've lost count as to the number of times that I've gotten to stand right down front, wherever we may have been, whether in a church or at some sort of outside venue, there is nothing, there is nothing like the sight of that woman standing at the back when she first begins to walk down and locks eyes with her husband. And I hope this doesn't sound weird to you at all, right? The, the view that I got to see one day when my Sharon was at the back of the church and those doors opened up and it was, oh my goodness. I've never seen anything like that before. And then God has given me this blessing of actually, I get to experience a much reduced version of that every wedding that I get to officiate. I'm like a blubbering idiot sometimes as I stand there because I'm just like, there's the bride. And she has never looked as beautiful. And I'm not saying anything ugly about that. She has never looked as beautiful as she does there that very day. I, I'll be honest with you, church, sometimes babies are ugly, right? We all say, oh, that's such a beautiful baby. And you go, no, that's really a pretty ugly kid. I mean, if we're just being really blunt with each other, there is no such thing as an ugly bride, right? There is no such thing. And the scripture teaches us that this place that God is preparing for us will be as a bride adorned for her husband. And it's a place also, church, where there'll be no more death. Did you see that in those verses that we just read? There will be no more death. There is no more need for mourning in heaven. You will never mourn again. There's a place where there's no more tears. But when God restores our bodies and restores this planet called earth, there'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain anymore. To be clear, when Jesus promises a new earth, what does he mean? He means a new earth. And what will you find on earth? You will find earthly things on earth, right? And what are earthly things that we will find in this place called a new heaven, a new earth? We'll find mountains and rivers and beautiful freshwater streams. And I believe ancient cypress trees like we've never seen before. And there'll be valleys. And if you're a high plains kind of man or if you're a Midwesterner, there'll be plains as far as the eye can see that have never looked as beautiful as they do. There'll be trees of all sorts and flowers and plants and grasses. There will be people of all sorts. A beautiful diversity of life will be there. Of people from all ethnic backgrounds and all colors of skin will be there. There'll be houses and cities and buildings and streets. Yes, these things are specifically mentioned in the scriptures, and I don't think they're just metaphorical, but, but God has given us this beautiful creation that we will occupy. And then in verse 6, there we will drink from the spring of the water of life without payment. Pastor and author Randy Alcorn, in thinking about this, he wrote that the problem is not that the Bible doesn't tell us much about heaven. The problem is that we don't pay attention to what it tells us. Isn't that good? So do you want to know today what the eternal heaven will look like? I would suggest you start by looking around you on this earth right here and right now. Alcorn writes, the present earth is as much a valid launching point for envisioning what the new earth would look like as our present bodies are a valid reference point for envisioning what our new bodies will look like one day. Paul Marshall's written a book about heaven, and he, and he says this, he says, this world is our home. We are made to live here. It has been devastated by sin, but God plans to put it right. We can love this world because it is God's, and it will be healed, becoming at last what God intended from the very beginning. So church, listen to me. God isn't going to abandon his creation. He is going to redeem it and restore it. Our good and kind and gracious God chooses to redeem mankind, and he also chooses to redeem earth. And have you ever wondered why? Why? He doesn't have to do this. Why does he make such a promise, and why is he always faithful to his promises? Why does he do this? Church, I believe it's for no other reason than this. He does it to glorify himself forever. In the company.
company of created. And that place is a real place called earth where the scripture teaches this heaven will come down and join one day. A resurrected life in a resurrected body with a resurrected Jesus on a resurrected earth. Revelation 21.3 contains, I think, quite honestly, one of the greatest promises that is ever recorded in our scripture. Revelation 21.3, go back and look at this. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people be with them as their God. Do you see that promise? The promise is Emmanuel. The promise is God with us. The promises as we've already begun to hear about from the Webb family today, uh, the promise of a coming king, that God himself in the flesh will come and will be with us. The new earth is the place that you were made for with God himself, the resurrected Jesus in his real resurrected body. We will be with the one that we were always designed to be with. This is the way, church, that God has always planned it. All the way back in the, in the prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 27, God says, my dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. In 2 Corinthians 6, 16, Paul writes, I will make my dwelling among them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Do you recall how Jesus spoke to his disciples shortly before he was, was arrested and taken away to be crucified? In that great epic chapter, John chapter 14, verse 3, Jesus says, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Do you hear the very promise of God that he makes to you? He said, listen, I promise that you and I will spend all of eternity together. Because think about heaven. Without Jesus, what would heaven be like? Wouldn't be heaven, would it? Without Jesus, heaven is, a, is like a palace without a king. It's a place that I'd just rather not be. And so let me ask you, have you ever, in your imaginations, have you ever just wanted to walk and talk with Jesus? Like the disciples did after he was resurrected, walking on that road to Emmaus. Have you ever wanted just to have that type of time that you could spend with your Savior? The Bible promises you will. You will one day if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Have you ever just wanted to sit maybe by the shore of a body of water with an early morning fire going and some fish are being broiled there, just a little light breakfast is being made and Christ himself in the flesh is right there with you? And if you just wanted to leisurely just have that time and just to sit and be with him, you will one day. The scripture promises that God will be with us. H have you, like me, ever just wanted to sit at his feet and just to be in his presence, just to say, you are my king, and I can't even talk. I just want to be with you. I just, I just cannot believe that you would allow me into the same room with you. You will have that chance one day. As a follower of Jesus Christ, the scripture promises us that God will be with us. So church, as amazing as the promise of eternal life really is, as beautiful as the new earth will be, as wondrous as it will be to be reunited with my family who are Christ followers that have died and, and gone on before me and my friends and my neighbors that I loved so deeply, as glorious as my new resurrected body will be one day that is totally free from pain and it's free from sickness and it's free from just the utter decay that happens currently to our bodies, none of that compares to being in the presence of Christ himself and enjoying fellowship with him forever. Amen. Our greatest joy is going to be in seeing the Lord himself in all of his glory. See, John tells us that the culmination of all of our blessings that God has in store for us is that we shall see his face. And hasn't that been also all you've ever really wanted? Hasn't that been true of mankind almost since the very beginning? All we've ever really wanted it's just to see God and to be with him. Remember, what was, what was Moses? What was his great request? What did Moses want? I just want to see the Lord. I just want to see the face of God. 
King David wrote about it in his 27th Psalm in verse 4. He says, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That's all King David ever wanted. As close as that man's heart was to God, he said, all I ever want to do is just to see my king. So church, maybe for the last time in this series, are you ready to use your holy imagination one last time? We've been doing this throughout this series where, where we are given the ability with our creative minds that God gave us to think and to ponder and to imagine about what it might be like. And so long as those are nicely connected with the truth of Scripture, I think God blesses us with using our imaginations. So what do you imagine it will be like to see your Savior face to face. What's it going to be like? Often at funerals, we pause and, and we listen to the song that's played over the, the PA system, or maybe somebody performs it live. What will it be like to see your king face to face? Have you ever thought about it? When you look into his face, you're going to see infinite love and infinite grace and mercy. You're gonna see everything that is good and righteous and kind when you look into the face of Jesus. You're gonna stare, and I'm gonna stare one day into the perfect face of love and joy and peace. There will be a day, God promises, where you get to come eye to eye with what perfect power and perfect holiness and perfect justice looks like when you look into the face of Jesus, all you have ever wanted is found in him. The very lover of your soul, the creator who breathed life into your body, you will be able to look at and he will look back at you and all of your desires will be satisfied. All of those longings that you've had that have always remained just a distant thing will come true in him. And I believe at that time we will eagerly join countless others who have been redeemed from across all the ages of time as we will all easily and eagerly sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. I, I end with this, and I think in, in all the years of preaching I've never ended in such a way. So bear with me, okay? I'm taking just a little bit of a, of a deviation from what is normal for me with a poem that pastor and theologian and John Piper wrote about just this. It's short, but it is to the point. Piper writes, as I knelt beside the brook to drink eternal life, I took a glance across the golden grass and saw my dog, old Blackie, fast as she could come. She leaped the stream, almost, and what a happy gleam was in her eye. I knelt to drink, and I knew that I was on the brink of endless joy. And everywhere I turned and saw a wonder there. A big man running on the lawn, that's old John Young with both legs on. The blind can see a bird on wing. The dumb can lift their voice to sing. The diabetic eats at will, the coronary runs uphill. The lame can walk, the deaf can hear, the cancer-ridden bone is clear. Arthritic joints are lithe and free, and every pain has ceased to be. And every sorrow deep within and every trace of lingering sin is gone. And all that's left is joy and endless ages to employ the mind and heart and understand in the love to the sovereign Lord who planned that it should take all of eternity to lavish all of his grace on me. Isn't that good? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God,